Welcome to the Luxury Leadership Talks, a podcast and videocast in which I interview the most remarkable and influential leaders of this powerful industry. People who shaped the past of the luxury and also its future. My name is Mikael Merck and I've been working for and with this powerful industry for the past 20 years. And this allowed me to meet with people, with very inspirational people who really have a word to say in this business and whose word should be heard and shared. And for today's episode, I'm here in Reims, the heart of the Champagne region. Um, actually, I'm quite frequently here because for the past six years, I've been a member of the advisory board of the oldest family-owned champagne house, L'Enson BCC. If you're not familiar with this group, it comprises seven champagne houses, Champagne Chanoine Frère, Boisel, De Venoge, Philippe Bonin, Alexandre Bonnet, Pesra de Belfond, and the biggest of the seven houses, Champagne Lançon. And for today, it's my pleasure to interview the president of Champagne Lançon, François Vanal. Hello, Michaela. Hello, François. Uh, thank you for hosting me at the place where you have your head office, where you are shaping the strategy of Champagne Lançon, and also which is a very special place because uh, there's a vineyard not far away, and right below our knees, there are big wine cellars, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe you can say a few words about, about the brand and also the, the place where you are yeah, today. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for being here. Very happy to share this moment with you to talk about luxury in general yes. and Champagne Lançon in particular. Yes, indeed, we are in the heart of the Champagne Lançon headquarters in the center of the city of Reims. The Cathedral of Reims, which is worldwide known, mm. is only a couple of miles away. And in this place, we actually have one hectare of vineyards, which is on a hill overlooking the whole city of Reims and the Cathedral uh, of Reims. With this one hectare, called the Clos Lançon, we mm -hmm. make about seven to 8,000 bottles. But underneath your feet, behind your feet, mm -hmm. we also have seven kilometers of cellars and more than 20 million bottles of champagne aging. So it's a very special place here. But champagne Lançon, aside from the headquarters in Reims, we also have four press houses where mm -hmm. we actually press the grapes during harvest. We have one press house in the mythical village of Verzonnet mm -hmm. in the Pinot Noir. We have one in Dizy near Epernay. We have one in Trépaille, very strong wine. And we also have one in the Côte des Bars, which is south of the AOC Champagne mm -hmm. near Troyes. And uh, I remember there's one where Napoleon uh, stayed is, because he loved Champagne, right? <laughs> very true. Napoleon, during his European campaign, uh, stayed in the Pressoir de Dizy. So my predecessors hosted him a few centuries ago, but it's, it's a good history. I mean, you put the finger where, sh where we should because Lançon is all about history. It's mm -hmm. almost three centuries old. Lançon just celebrated two years ago his 260th mm. anniversary. So what a legacy, what a brand. Mm. And I think luxury is all about history, legacy, and stories. Mm. And it's also all about love, right? <laughs> right. So the, the new platform of Champagne Lançon, uh, it's, uh, it's all about love. And this claim is not innocent. It, it encapsulates what we want to say about Lançon Champagne. You know, Lançon Champagne is now in 83% um, of the shipments international. Yes. Uh, and mainly our biggest market is in UK. Yeah. Uh, in UK, uh, we, are, we are lucky to be the first champagne house in year 1900 to be delivered by the Queen Victoria, the Royal Warrant. And you still have it, right? And we still have it 122 years ago. And the Royal Warrant is, uh, you know, the, the, the symbol of uh, the Royal Family of England is actually symbolized on all and single, every single bottle uh, of Lançon across, uh, across the ranch. Mm. UK is a very special market as mm -hmm. well because uh, we are also partner for the last 45 years with the Wimbledon Grand Chelem tournament. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Wimbledon is very special, very it elegant is. for yes. English people. And uh, uh, it, it's a very good partnership we have indeed. Phenomenal. UK. I mean, you've been now president for 
four years almost yes. with Lançon. Yeah. Um, after an international career at uh, Remy Cointreau. Uh, I think what was very special about this career move was that uh, you joined a family-owned uh, business, um, taking over the presidency of the biggest champagne house, but without being a family member, right? Um, at the same time, I know that within a very short period of time, you've been extremely successful. When you look back in four years, you doubled the turnover, uh, you revolutionized the brand positioning, and you're also very well respected by all family members. So yeah. can you can you share with us how you, how you did that? <laughs> what kind of leadership qualities yeah. do you need to put in yeah. place to get there? Yeah. Well, thank you for this question. Uh, on, on the first part, of your question concerning family, I think um, it's very important. I mean, to uh, it's very different, but very important also to work for a family-owned company. It's nothing about short-term profit mm -hmm. to raise the price of the stock. Mm -hmm. It's really about how do I take the brands and I give it to my kids in a better shape than when I hide it from my parents. So it's all about long-term development, sustainability. Yes. I think we're going to talk about that mm, later. Yes. And how do I, do I bring it to my family? So there's a special meaning about a family-owned company, which I, I really like. Rémi Cointreau, as you mentioned, was a family-owned company as well. Mm -hmm. And Lançon, uh, indeed. And today, uh, the Lançon Group is uh, owned by three uh, uh, Reims based origin family. Mm -hmm. So we don't have big head office in Paris. You know, it's really in the heart of the region, uh, in the vineyards with the wine growers. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and the family group is a, what we like, we like to call a pure champagne player. You mentioned in your introduction seven brands. We only do champagnes, we don't have other scotch, cognac, uh, uh, or other wines in our portfolio. Mm. Focus. So, we are, we are really focused, mm. uh, indeed. So, family uh, company, and, and indeed you mentioned in your questions that uh, we've been quite successful. I think it's a combination of uh, hard work, mm -hmm. I think a bit of luck as mm -hmm. well with the markets over the last year and a half in luxury, 2021 and the first eight months of 2022, incredibly positive. So I think we surfed mm -hmm. uh, on this. But I would say it's also what we got or what I got when I came on board four years ago, indeed. Lançon has everything to succeed. Lançon has a fantastic history, 260 years. The wine have never been as qualitative uh, as today, and mm -hmm. I can talk further a bit about the wine later on. And this needs to be built. <laughs> if you wish, and this, this needs to be built. And we have the people. Yes. Uh, uh, People working at Lançon are very loyal, yes. a lot of fidelity. You don't have they, a lot of turnover, right? It's, very few turnover. Yeah. People are very engaged. Yeah. They're very loyal to this brand. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a very emotional brand that people like to relate to. Mm -hmm. So I think with the combination of these three pieces recipe, we can only succeed if we work hard. Mm. And, and I think uh, now knowing as a member of the board, the house pretty well, uh, the, the long-term vision is extremely important, as you said, not just short-term profit, but really see where do I want to go. Clearly. So it's, it's not a matter of one person vision strategy. It's really a teamwork. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone has been engaged in this new, what we call the reconquest plan four years ago when we got on board. Mm -hmm. we, we, we actually started from a white page of paper, what do we, where do we come from, what is our history, what do we want to say? And then we involved into various um, working groups on different topics. Mm -hmm. We involved every person from the uh, company in every different services or every, every layer. Yes. And everyone, we believe, were open to be creative, to give their input and then take the ownership of what we want to do. It's very different in a company, especially in luxury, when you come on board and you say, you know what, I know everything, I have experience, we have to do this, this, this and this, please execute. Lançon's strategy is the opposite. Mm -hmm. We want people to be involved from the start, give their ideas, their experience, and by building the vision, the strategy together, they take the ownership, mm -hmm. it federates people, yes. and I think it's delivered even better. That's yeah. what we're trying to do uh, mm -hmm. at Lançon. Yeah. Uh, talking about luxury, let, let, let's talk a bit about, about this very particular and very demanding sector. Um, why would you say uh, Champagne, and especially Champagne Lançon, is premium, is luxury? What, what does it, yeah. uh, how does that fit in? Yeah, I would say Champagne in general, and Lançon indeed, is, is luxury. Um, before coming to the most, I would say, visible part of the world of luxury, 
which we need to quote it, it's pricing. Mm -hmm. I just want to say that luxury, it's also about quality, yes. mm -hmm. quality of the material. You know, either you do uh, watches or bags uh, or or uh, fashion, mm -hmm. you have to have quality materials. In Champagne, it's the same. You have to start with the best selection of the best grapes. Mm -hmm. You know, in Champagne, uh, we are lucky to have 17 villages in Grand Cru Champagne, which is uh, the best grapes. Mm -hmm. Then we have Premier Cru, mm -hmm. and then we have the, the rest of the vineyards. And we can say at Lançon that in all our 10 produce cuvée, we use a minimum of 50% of Grand Cru and Premier Cru. Mm -hmm. The best grapes, the most expensive, but also the grapes that give the, the best potential for building aromas and taste. Mm -hmm. The second thing about you know, quality, it, it's about the, uh, uh, the, the percentage of reserve wine that we bring in the blending. Mm -hmm. You know, Champagne is about uh, assembling wines together, blending. Mm -hmm. And at Lançon, we put a minimum of 35% reserve wine, which is not the harvest of the year, but which is wine which has been aged, usually in wood casks for a few years, and gives taste, aromas, style, personality to the yeah. wine. That, that's the second point. Another aspect of the quality uh, of, uh, of Champagne Lançon is that we are doing the traditional method of fermentation, mm -hmm. uh, which is the non-lactic. Mm -hmm. So we block the malic acid into the lactic acid mm -hmm. uh, in order to keep the wine with a very fresh, fruity, and elegant aspects. Mm -hmm. And then the last point of the quality is about the aging. At Lançon, we age four years minimum the black label, up to 10 years for the vintage year. Today, mm -hmm. we're on the, on the vintage 2012. Mm -hmm. and you know, all the way to 20 years for the prestige cuvée, like Noble Champagne. Mm -hmm. So that's signs of quality, of luxury, of Champagne, and also in particular. Then why is it luxury? I think it's also about pricing. When you talk about Champagne, you talk about products between 30 euros up to 250 euros, sometimes more, 500, 800. Yeah. So luxury is defined by quality, uh, but also by how it's positioned uh, within the market. But the price is, also, is always... Um, a consequence of how you make the know-how, the craftsmanship, uh, you know, personalized, handmade. Mm -hmm. Did you know that in Champagne, for example, um, uh, legally, we cannot harvest uh, with a machine. Mm -hmm. Everything all, needs to be done by hand, right? Everything. So all <laughs> yeah. the 35,000 hectares of the AOC, the Appellation d'Origine Contrôle of Champagne, is done by hand uh, every year. So. Uh, it's about caring, it's about craftsmanship, it's about handmade, yeah. uh, it's not industrialized production, yeah. uh, big volumes. Right. And I've, I've even seen that uh, sometimes you're using horses now, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, for, for a few parcels, uh, for example, the Clos Lanston, the one hectare. The, the high on, level. <laughs> on the hill, the high level yeah. is about 240 euros a bottle, uh -huh. indeed. Uh, we, uh, um, you know, we, we, we uh, turn the mud. With a, with a horse rather than a machine. It is also, so f also true for our 16 hectare uh, organic um, vineyards uh, in Verneuil, where yeah. we take out the green label cuvee. Uh, it's also done by, uh, by horses. Uh, you, so you have with the, biggest, uh, the, the biggest uh, parcel of organic uh, yeah. vineyards in Champagne, no? Yeah, yeah indeed. The, the group purchased about 10 years ago uh, 16 hectares in the Vallée de la Marne, mm -hmm. which is beautiful grapes, mm -hmm. uh, in organic, which means, you know, a lot of caring, uh, no pesticide, uh, and it's uh, something that we, we, we bring with a special cuvée called the Lanson Green Label, and mm -hmm. we're very proud of it. It's a biodynamic uh, cuvée. Fantastic. You mentioned the importance of quality. Um, I mean, in order to obtain the best quality, you need to collaborate with a chef de cave. I know with Lanson, it's Hervé Danton. So you need to collaborate with top experts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, big characters. And uh, uh, how do you collaborate that in terms of leadership as a president and also to somehow manage a Chef de Cave? Is yeah. he manageable? Are Chef de Caves manageable? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hervé Danton, the Chef de Cave, is the person who gives the style of the house, but who, who is also the, uh, I would say, the, the gatekeeper of yeah. all the, uh, the treasure we have in the cellar with the old vintages. You know that at Lançon, we have uh, vintages dating back from 1904, uh, 
principally in magnum sizes, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a seller called Paradis Lançon. Mm, uh, the and treasure of the brand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we call it the, the collection Lançon. It's a treasure we have. And the chef de cave is also taking care of it. So it's a very important person, a lot of respect, as you say, mm -hmm. and communi communication is very important between yeah. uh, myself and, uh, uh, and Hervé, mm. indeed. Now in luxury, we love stories. <laughs> we love true stories, but also nicely told. Um, is there any story you would like to share with us about the legacy of Champagne Lançon? Yeah, um, there's really one story that struck me when I, when I, I joined the company uh, four years ago. It's uh, the story of the son of the founder of Lançon. You know, Lançon was founded in 1760. The son of the founder was a member of the Order of Malta. Mm -hmm. The Order of Malta is the oldest caritative organization association founded in year 1048. And, you know, this association is all about... Um, uh, elegance, authenticity, uh, openness, caring. And uh, he, he wanted to give a sign that Champagne Lançon uh, is supporting all those values. Mm -hmm. So on every single bottle of Lançon since 1798, when he started this decision, we have the red uh, Maltese cross, which mm -hmm. actually became a Lançon red cross now, mm -hmm. on the bottles. It's really the icon. It's really the icon of mm -hmm. Lançon. And it's really how we recognize the brand. And it's not innocent because it also gives the personality of Lançon. You know, the platform we built, the new platform we built of Lançon, it's all about love, mm -hmm. comes from this uh, um, generosity, openness. Mm -hmm. And you, you ask about the story, but you know that during World War I, yeah. the city of Reims was really under big uh, bombing, yeah. you know. And uh, uh, Lançon hosted in the cellars uh, all the Reims community, so in the seven kilometers, you know, with kids, uh, uh, wife, uh, husband, you had school, you had weddings. They were weddings. protected, in, they the, were protected in, the, in the cellar. From the bombs in, in the cellars, mm -hmm. you had beds. You know, in the cellars, it's 13 degrees Celsius the whole year. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine in winter or, you know, it, it's, it's quite difficult to, um, to, to live there. Wow. But it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a story of a sign of what Lançon wants to to talk about. Mm, which are the values that are steer, still here today and which you can feel in, in, in everything that you're doing with your teams and Totally, totally. Everybody. Another element which is important in luxury is always to create a maximum amount of desirability. Now, you have a lot of competing brands, other champagne houses, many of them are owned by LVMH, uh, Moët de Chandon, Ruinard, Veuve Clicquot, Krug, you, you name them. Um, and at the same time, you also have a lot of um, competing drinks, which you could yeah. use for receptions, for dinner, for lunch, for any kind of festive occasions. So um, it's very important to create uh, yeah, desirability. And I know that you revamped, you reworked, repositioned the brand uh, in order to make it even more desirable. Can you yeah. maybe say a few words about what you did, what was the twist that you gave the brand to make it yeah, yeah. enhance desirability? I mean, very true. Consumers have choice. They have choice within the champagne industry, mm. but as you mentioned, they also have choice with uh, all the types of cocktails, you know, and right. aperitif. So what we need is to stand out and be different, be bold, be creative, while keeping the style and the authenticity of the history of Lançon. Mm -hmm. And that's where the balance is, is hard to find. Now, how do you want to be creative and be a bit, uh, you know, care, uh, uh, bold and, 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 and uh, daring? Uh, uh, while keeping this quite, you know, classic uh, historical uh, uh, company. So to bring desirability to a luxury brand and Chopin House in particular, mm -hmm. it's a combination of recipe of many different ingredients. It's not one thing you push. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's an addition of many sure. things. So the first thing we've done, is, we've done is clearly to simplify the range from mm -hmm. 15 to 10 QV and then give a new communication platform, uh, a new identity, uh, a new key visual, the visual of Lançon with the hands of, mm -hmm. of Hervé Danton. We well, you can see him. the values again, exactly. right? So uh, it's, it's the first time that uh, you could see a visual where a champagne bottle was actually put in hands. Exactly, uh, put in hands. Uh, and not and standing straight. <laughs> exactly, not vertical, mm -hmm. in the hands. And there is a, a sign almost of nativity. 
You know, it's like when the baby is born, you give the baby to the mother. There is nothing more caring than that. So the symbol we wanted to give with this visual mm -hmm. is the chef de cave with all the care he's giving to the, to the blending and to the aging, and, uh, but also the, the winemaker mm. is presenting the champagne to uh, the consumers and, uh, mm. and, uh, and the clients. Almost like you're raising your child, right? Uh, Giving the best care. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It, it, it's all about caring. Mm. So desirability comes from that, but it also comes from uh, uh, you know, taking care of the commercial part. Yeah. Uh, we've totally rebuilt uh, the route to market, the commercial organization with six different hubs. Uh, we've changed uh, a few key uh, importers, mm -hmm. uh, for example, in US and Germany, because mm -hmm. they are our voice on the markets and we need to have people we share the same values. Um, very important markets as well. Mm -hmm. Very important champagne market, mm -hmm. uh, indeed. Uh, yeah, and, and um, by do doing all these elements, uh, you know, we came out with uh, something which was uh, uh, clear, uh, transparent, which makes sense, mm -hmm. which was attaching to the past, but also the vision for the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we cleaned a little bit the, the simplicity mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of the brand. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, despite the fact that we all went through a, a very difficult uh, COVID uh, 2020, I mm -hmm. think uh, luxury brands and champagne in particular showed a fantastic rebound in 2021. And the first, uh, you know, eight months of 2022 is also mm -hmm. showing very, very good perspective mm. for the luxury brands, despite the fact of the you know, geopolitical context right. that we know with the uh, Ukraine uh, today. Exactly. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very interesting what you say that you are simplifying, actually. You were simplifying, meaning clarifying, and sometimes, yeah, in luxury, we always say less is more, to really do things straight to the point. Um, I have a question since you were revisiting the brand. Uh, y when you do that, you always need to embark your teams. You need yeah. to make sure that you have all of them with you, that they yeah. also support this move. Um, how do you do it as a, as a leader of the brand so that everybody is following and yeah. contributing? Yeah, well, we try to uh, select uh, people that come from different horizons, mm -hmm. different background, uh, different experiences, put them together on the table mm -hmm. and have some uh, very open, creative uh, brainstorming uh, without any uh, uh, censure mm -hmm. uh, so that people can express themselves. They feel at ease. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the click comes in and you can see really people having fun and actually delivering some fantastic idea that we put together on a piece of paper and then we brainstorm and it actually comes out after a few weeks, after a few months, into an actual idea mm -hmm. in terms of cuvee, in terms of distribution, mm -hmm. in terms of communication, in terms of promotions. So having, uh, giving the, the people from the company the strength to change the destiny of the brands through their ideas, uh, I think is the best way to engage people and, and to make mm -hmm. them... Uh, uh, owner, of, own, owner of the, of, of the of, brand, of the brand, and mm. even more motivated. Did you also integrate people really from the field? Yes, yeah, yeah, we did. I think there's nothing more important than people who know the, the final uh, consumers, but also the clients mm. who see the reality, you know, of a of a bar, of a restaurant, uh, of a seller, uh, even off trade. So it's very important to, to, to have the feedback mm -hmm. uh, facing the reality of, uh, of competition. Mm. So it's the addition of all these different aspects, experiences that, uh, that makes the brand work. And then, uh, and then people deliver with proud. And yeah. they, you know, they, they try to, fed, we, we federate people mm. uh, uh, within the, uh, the vision of, uh, of the company. Yeah, so right. it's, very, it's very important. You, you talk about clients, the importance of clients. Um, how did champagne consumption change over the years when it started like uh, mid 18th century yeah. until today? I'm pretty sure that a lot of ch has changed in the way you drink champagne compared yeah. to the first days. No, you're right. The first days <laughs> in the middle of the 18th century, when you think of it, in 1750, you know, champagne was created. It's, uh, it's uh, white wine sparkling, you know, and people were drinking that uh, you know, for uh, aperitif or for, uh, you know, before dinner. It, it was quite uh, associated to uh, uh, rigid uh, black tie, uh, you know, high-end uh, 
event only. Mm -hmm. I would say that the beauty of the champagne industry today is a, it's a good balance between luxury, because we're in the world of luxury, because of what we mentioned before, mm -hmm. but also uh, it moved into a more relaxed and more cool and trend setting. Yes. You know, it's very easy to drink champagne, you know, uh, outside for a picnic, you know, wearing a short or a jean, a white t-shirt. You don't need to be in black tie. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can also do that. But uh, so I think to answer your questions, the champagne consumptions over the years moves into a, a more open, democratic, uh, accessible uh, to, uh, to, to, to more people mm -hmm. uh, across the world. But also, I think it becomes very, very international. Champagne, when it started, was really French. Yeah. And then every year go that goes by, uh, international. Uh, like internationally, who are the, where are the biggest uh, consumers well, in consumption? Well, the, the top 10 champagne brands uh, globally, that I'm not going to mention, but people know, you know, more than 80% of the sales are international outside of France. Mm. Total champagne market is about 55% um, uh, export, 45% France, but within the international brands, uh, they represent more than 80%. Mm -hmm. For Lanson in particular, mm -hmm. we export 83% uh, of, the, of the shipments yes. uh, in different markets yeah. like uh, UK, Japan, mm -hmm. Australia, New Zealand, mm -hmm. uh, uh, US, mm -hmm. uh, Germany, mm -hmm. and uh, a yeah. few other markets. And I think it was, uh, if you go back to the very beginnings, it was Louis XV who, who was the first to commercialize Champagne true. in France, right? True. That's true. Louis XV was, uh, you know, one of the king of France who really uh, put the, put the champagne forward on the scene. And actually, one of the champagne house of the Lançon BCC group that you mentioned earlier, De Venoge, De Venoge exactly, uh, is uh, is actually um, having Louis XV as the uh, the ambassador yes. of, of their brand. Mm. So yeah, it's, it's uh, mm -hmm. indeed. We were talking about change. There's another type of change in the air that everybody is talking about, climate change. And climate change is a big impact for the champagne business because good quality grapes, it depends on the climate and uh, the soil, the rain, the heat. <laughs> and uh, if you have uh, too much change, especially if the uh, temperature goes up year after year, uh, it might be risky for the champagne production in the coming years. So what do you do as the president of a champagne house yeah. in order to yeah, act yeah. maybe responsibly uh, in this context? Yeah. No, it's a very good question, especially for champagne, which is built out of land, out mm -hmm. of nature. Climate change, climate change is a very big topic yeah. that we are very much... Uh, concern with. I think the most visible part of this climate change for us in Champagne is the time of the harvest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, previously the harvest was very often October, end of September. Now more and more the harvest is in August. Yeah. Uh, much earlier. Yeah, m much earlier mm. because the grapes with the, with the heat is maturing faster yeah. and, uh, and, and clearly now it's, it's sooner and, and sooner. So that's, that's very visible. So. Uh, what we are trying uh, to do uh, about this is really uh, put the um, CSR strategy, sustainability, mm -hmm. uh, in the heart of all our strategy, our vision. We uh, involved every single person of the company with this strategy, mm -hmm. whereas it is environmental with our teams, you know, in the vineyards, uh, our chef de cave, uh, people taking care mm -hmm. of the of the cuverie uh, and our wine growers, mm -hmm. but also. Uh, you know, with the social pillar of the CSR, right. social, societ societal, you know, all the HR is also very actively looking at, uh, you know, you know, the best way to, uh, to, to move the right direction uh, with this uh, sustainability uh, that w w we're looking for, but also economically. Uh, more and more, you know, we look at uh, how can we, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, have a circular economy, uh, have uh, a local uh, sourcing mm -hmm. uh, of all the, uh, the the dry goods that uh, that is needed on the bottles. The uh, the, uh, the the labels uh, is coming as. I think as you are among the first champagne houses that really openly put on uh, all the percentages. I've seen that on the label on yeah. the backside of the label where you can exactly see. What's inside, right? Right. Yeah, there is a big link between, in, indeed, how transparent we are in the ingredients and, and CSR. Yes. Because uh, 
we're trying to be as direct, as transparent as possible with the consumers. So uh, within the program of relaunching the 10 QV with the new packaging, indeed, on the mm -hmm. back label, um, we are giving most of the information that we can give to consumers in terms of, you know, what percentage of each of which cépage. Mm -hmm. You know, in Champagne, you have three cépages, and the yes. Chardonnay, the Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier. Uh, we, we, did a num we, we give the number of cru mm -hmm. uh, and what percentage of grand and premier cru goes uh, into the wine. We also give you know, the number of years aging uh, in the cellars. Mm -hmm. we, give the, we give the disgorgement date. Uh, uh, you know, we give the, the level of sugar that is added, usually you know, yeah. uh, between 6 and 8% sugar per, per litre. Mm -hmm. So we try to be as transparent as possible mm -hmm. to give this... Uh, you know, that we don't, we don't have anything to hide. Mm -hmm. We're just delivering. Mm -hmm. And that's new. Yeah, yeah, more and more. Yeah. We are thinking, exactly. And it's part of luxury. We, if you are able to give trustability exactly. to where the products come from yes. and say it very openly to yeah. the consumer, I think there is a reassurance. Because today in luxury, and in Champagne in particular, people buy a brand because a brand communicates, have a good image, but they don't want to buy a brand which they don't relate to in terms of... Uh, of CSR yes. and sustainability. And you know, want to know what you what you consume. Exactly. That's very important. Exactly, yeah. where, where it comes from, what yeah. you consume. Um, another aspect which is important is innovation. Um, yeah. In luxury, we always want to be a trendsetter, be ahead of time, be extremely creative. So what do you do with your teams in order to make sure that uh, yeah, they're somehow creative, but knowing that you have a lot of restrictions in the champagne business. So there are some limits as well, yeah. more limits than maybe in other industry sectors. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's what the balance should be fine indeed. And it's good. It's a good thing that we have restrictions mm -hmm. because I think the champagne committee, committee has worked extremely well over the last few decades to, to bring up uh, the name of champagne as a luxury uh, sparkling wine coming from France. It's a protected name. Mm -hmm. And really, Champagne is a luxury brand in itself. Before you, talk, you talk about the brand in particular, yes. Champagne's had a lot, a lot of imaginary, a lot of emo emotional connection uh, by, the, by the consumer. Yeah. Um, so the restriction we have is clearly that the grapes to produce Champagne has to come from the 35,000 hectares yes. of the AOC, the Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée. And here we have rarity per se. <laughs> uh, it's clearly rarity, you know. Yeah. If you have, let's say, 12,000 kilo per hectare of production, it's roughly 340 million bottles per year. Mm. And the AOC is the AOC, it cannot go, go up, no. or it's very long. So if the demand continues to go up, there will be more demand than supply, mm -hmm. and there will be scarcity of grapes and products, yeah. and then, of course, uh, the, the impact on, uh, on uh, allocation and uh, out of stock, and clearly uh, pricing on champagne. So the, the other aspect of, uh, um, of the um, uh, thing that we have to, to look at is the, uh, the aging, and you need to age a minimum of 15 months. As I said before, mm -hmm. Lanson is aging much longer yes. because of the non-malolactic fermentation that is part of the original process of Lanson. We need to age longer to give this freshness, uh, this elegance, this fruitiness, yes. while having the, uh, the wine mature enough for a great consumption. Mm -hmm. So within this restriction, uh, once we put it aside, we try to be as creative as possible. And we really try to, un to unleash the team to be, uh, to be creative. How, how do you master that as, as their leader, <laughs> president? Yeah, yeah. well, we, we try to make them feel at ease. We really uh, uh, have a, a, a brainstorming to set up where we want to go and, and what everyone needs to, to be or to say. And we have mm -hmm. some, you know, game playing, acting role so that people feel really a niche. And, and, and then that's, that's where the ideas come from. Mm -hmm. And on all the projects we worked on, which actually translated into actual cuvee or, or limited edition or promotion. Now, it's not just words. Mm -hmm. uh, people uh, in this working group were the initial persons to, to, to build this idea. Yes. So it's incredible what you can get in terms of creativity if you let people open up. Go and, yeah, and don't judge them exactly, wrong or right. Exactly. Mm. Without any feeling, oh, yeah. I shouldn't say that, I'm going to be... Uh, yeah. And, and um, uh, it can go really far. Right. And, and apart from creating new ideas, 
it also builds this attachment to the brand in, in such a strong way. Sure. That's what we're trying to do. Okay. Like uh, awesome. going far, which are the biggest challenges for the coming years, in your opinion? Well, there is challenges that we can control and challenges that we cannot control. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge that we cannot control is what we've all gone through recently, uh, the, uh, the, the COVID, previously in a the recession. Uh, well, currently we are going through this, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ukraine mm -hmm. war, which surprisingly, and in, in a paradox, I would say, is not impact, impacting the luxury industry. Not so far. Luxury industry has never been so healthy. I think I have a, a number in mind. I heard like 390 billion euros, the luxury industry worldwide, growing plus 12% versus, uh, versus previous years. So it's never been that healthy despite uh, this, this geopolitical mm -hmm, event mm -hmm. that we don't control. Mm -hmm. So aside from that, then what can we control to, mm -hmm. make, uh, to make the, um, the, uh, the, the, the luxury uh, and champagne uh, uh, build? So the, the challenges, to answer your question, the challenges that champagne uh, is, will be confronted with in the future it will clearly be linked to the um, offer and demand mm -hmm. uh, natural uh, uh, aspect of, economical, right. uh, of economics. Uh, we see every year that uh, because there is more demand than offer, the price of grapes, which is you know, a, a big part of the, yeah. of the cost of making uh, uh, a champagne bottle, is going to go very, very high. Mm -hmm. We're talking you know, 10% cost of grapes every year. So we have to tackle that mm -hmm. and we have to see how can we still provide champagne to uh, the most numbered uh, of people, people, be very open, mm -hmm. especially to young generations, while of course being able to, to sustain mm -hmm. this increase of cost of goods. Mm -hmm. I think that's I would, I would say one of the biggest challenge that we'll have in the future. So keep the cost reasonable and also make sure that uh, the wine is available uh, exactly. regarding the whole context. Exactly. Uh, also, while, yeah. while still being able to invest behind the brands because when you are present in more than 50 countries, which is the case for Lançon, yes. you need to have the brand exposed to the consumer. So you need to promote, to communicate, to invest on the market. So again, it, it's a natural balance to find between cost of good, cost of making products, and then the margin that enables us to promote and, mm -hmm. make, and make the brand known by, yes. by the consumers. Mm -hmm. I think any luxury brands is, is managing this. And, and I, I, after that, it's like a, a snowball effect, a virtual cycle, cycle where you know, the more you grow, the more you have absolute um, you know, uh, budget finance to be able to promote the mm -hmm. brands and put it towards to the, invest again. The, the consumers. Right. Exactly. Um, what would you say after a couple of years, uh, are you the most proud of looking at your accomplishments? Yeah, mm. yeah well, you know, it's, um, <laughs> as you've seen over the last half an hour we, we talked together, uh, we really tried to, to bring people and human uh, in the heart of their organization. That's true, you, you mentioned a lot the people we, yeah, and we, the importance of... <laughs> so I would say to, to answer your questions, what makes me proud of is not necessarily to, to double the turnover or to increase the profit or right. uh, you know, financial numbers, even though it's a consequence of what everything we do and it's, it's an objective. But you know, I would say when uh, someone working at Lançon uh, you know, comes to my office and you know, mm -hmm. you know Francois, um, I've never been under so much pressure, positive pressure. <laughs> I've never worked so hard, but I've never been so happy in my job. Wow. So, when people say that, I'm, a, I'm, I'm sitting back and I'm saying, you know what, it's exactly what I'm looking for. People enjoy coming to the office every day, work 8, 10, 12 hours uh, while being under pressure. Give the uh, most. And, and, you know, demanding uh, environments. And people sometimes, you know, thanks the company for giving this um, demanding and challenging um, uh, objective mm -hmm. that every, everyone has. Mm. I think you can be both challenged but also happy in what you're doing at the same time. Mm. I think that's the best ac Phenomenal. accomplishment you Beautiful. can hear from someone. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Can you give maybe some tips, some last tips to our listeners, uh, somebody who would love to work in the champagne business uh, in terms of uh, success, qualities, after all you observe, 
yeah. what you've done yourself. Yeah. Well, if you would like to work for Champagne Nanson in particular, please don't hesitate. <laughs> I would say, first of all, you like to, you, you need to enjoy wine. And really, it's, it's, we always talk about the products. At the end of the day, we sell wine. Uh, we sell, uh, um, you know, emotion. Uh, we sell uh, sharing and getting together. Uh, I think the champagne is uh, is a symbol of people, uh, you know, being together. You know, whether it's a wedding or it's an anniversary, a birthday, uh, it's, a, it's a very special product. So you, you need to like that. Um, I would say the tip is... Um, uh, is to know and listen to your uh, customers, uh, is to, uh, you know, make great wines because consumers are not stupid. Uh, you, may, you, you can have the best advertising campaign in the world. You can have the most money to put behind to make the products, champagne or luxury brands known to the customers. Mm -hmm. If intrinsically the quality of the product is not there, the consumer is going to find out and it's a short-term success. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to make uh, great wines. And then finally, I think, you know, to succeed, you have to be creative, bold, and you, like, you have to take risks to, to stand out, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, from all the, all, all the competition. Mm -hmm. And finally, I would say it also to have fun. You, to have fun. You, you need to have fun, you know, in, yeah. in what you're doing. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't do it well. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, yeah, so... Awesome. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, if somebody wants to see what it's all like in real and maybe uh, visit uh, the yeah. sellers, is yeah. it possible? What it, should they do? <laughs> definitely. You know, uh, you go on Google, you go Lançon, on the Lançon internet site, you know where to find us. We are in the heart of Reims. We have about 10,000 visitors every year that comes to, uh, to Lançon. Uh, we have about an hour and a half tour where you see the Clos Lançon, the vineyards. Mm -hmm. Then you see, uh, you know, the, the, the plots, the winery. You see the, the, the what we call the Chez Bois, mm -hmm. which is a wooden cask to age the reserve wines. Then you go 15, 20 meters underground. Take a jacket, it's a bit chilly, but mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to, to visit the seven kilometers of cellars, 20 million bottles. You go to the old vintages, what we call the Paradis Lançon, uh, sellers, beautiful thing to see, mm -hmm. and then you end up, you know, looking at the history of Lançon in a what we call the corridor of time, which the big milestone of Lançon in the history, and you end up with tasting a few cuvées. So please come to Lançon. We'll be very happy to uh, to have you here. It's a fantastic visit to do uh, by yourself with your husband or wife, or even in family. Mm -hmm. Kids love it, and uh, it's open to everyone. So we hope <laughs> to see you very soon at Lançon. Thank you very much, uh, François, for sharing all these insightful full information about Champagne, about the history, about all you've been doing, about your leadership with our listeners. And uh, let's uh, uh, take a glass. And I would simply say thank you to what you shared with us and good luck for the future of Champagne, Lançon, all yeah, the, the missions and the projects that you are going to carry for the coming years. Thank you, Thank you so I really much. I enjoyed the time together. Thanks a lot. Thank Cheer you. Cheers. Cheers. So if you appreciated this discussion as much as I did, then don't hesitate to share uh, the luxury leadership talks with your friends, with family members, with people who you think could really profit from the words and the insight of those remarkable leaders who have so much to share, who have so much to, to tell you about, to make business, to be successful, and uh, also comment it. And uh, as you know, it's visible on YouTube, it's visible on all the different channels, podcast channels, and I'm very much looking forward to welcoming you for our upcoming episode and the next guest. See you soon.